first yeah. one's something to expand on from last week. I talk about group projects and whether or not they were helpful in our own personal experiences or not. I think they're helpful. I mean, it gets, it, everyone gets a different opinion and then everybody's perspective, it changes yours. Mm -hmm. And talking about things, I think it just makes you want to ask more questions. And if there's a lot of work or a big workload, they can split it up amongst the group as well to make it easier. Right. Everybody can have equal parts. Anyone else? I'm good. Okay. Second is um, why are critical and creative thinking on the decline? What can be done? I'd say because we live in the, the information at the fingertips with our phones, with media and all that, social media and being able to get any kind of information we want. You don't really have to think about anything. That's true. And people who put their children in front of tablets or TVs. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, I think that it, some parents, they don't let their they don't let their children do as much. So mm -hmm. there used to be a time where when my girls were little, they would want to help like with cleaning. But in my head, it was just, okay, I'm just going to get it done as quick as possible because we have to do something else. So they would just, they wouldn't take an interest. Mm -hmm. But it's different now they're older. what can be done about it this is kind of a two-part on that one one thing uh, i read about um, what what i read about was that um tests in school test us a lot on our on paper learning and we are learning a lot more through visual media so the things we actually know aren't showing up because we're not being tested in the same way so I guess um, people would come off more as critical and creatively thinking if we were tested in the way that we learn. Makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. And most of them are, yeah, standardized tests. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't involve creative or critical thinking. It's just based on material. Anyone else? Eddie? I feel like creative, you say creative and critical thinking or creative yeah. and what? Creative, creative thinking is down because most people feel that most ideas have already been discovered by somebody. So it's really no reason to think creatively. You know what I'm trying to say? We've been alive on this planet a very long time. So it feels like every idea that you think of is really no originality in that concept. I don't know why critical thinking is down. People are just slow. Can't, can't really help with that one. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know. That article said it was not a priority in homes and schools. Mm -hmm. Critical or creative or both? Uh, creative. Yeah, it's also that. It's not a priority. You're not made to be a, you're not, how, not made, but you're not trained to be a creative thinker. You're more trained to just be able to do what you need to do to get your work done. Yeah, in regard to change. Yeah. 
So what can be done? Oh, shit. I mean, I mean, Amber kind of said it that to test us over what we how we learn versus doing one or the other, you know, keeping them separate or doing different things, testing, testing in a different way than you actually learn. That would be helpful. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on metacognition? How do you think it's a useful tool for individuals? I gotta get the tissue. I'll be right back. Deal. What? That's like introspect. Like it's like looking inside, like what the mission is, right? Like critical awareness of yourself. Okay. Um so how you act and how you think. How you think and how you learn. And I, basically the way that I understood it was finding your strengths and weaknesses. I mean, I think it's a useful tool. For sure, yeah. If you can figure out what how you learn or different learning styles or... Right. You can, Everybody learns differently. Yeah. Yeah, you can definitely... So if you can, if you can figure out how you learn and then apply it to your everyday life, I think that it is beneficial. Yeah, give you the best to yourself. Yeah, the best possible outcome. But I think you have to be able to be aware of it. You have to be aware of yourself and strengths and weaknesses. And I think it, I don't know, other. It's hard to think of yourself having with strengths and weaknesses. I think constructive criticism from other people work extremely well, especially when you're employed. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm good on this. Okay. Amber? I just agree that I think uh, self-awareness is very important to figure out how you learn and to use that for your benefit. Okay. All right. Um, the next one is, is ADHD overdiagnosed? If so, why? And what can be done to accurately be diagnosed? I think, yeah, ADHD. Yeah, that's a hard one. I would say, yeah, ADHD is overdiagnosed. And that's mostly because when it gets diagnosed, they're usually like young children. So children are hyperactive. They always want to do something. They're not going to pay attention to because class is boring as fuck. Children, you know, they don't really want to learn shit until they're older but is overdiagnosed I don't know how they would fix that problem to be real I don't think there's a way to fix that problem I mean there is but I don't I can't think of one off the top of my head I just feel like if the child is hyperactive hyperactivity doesn't mean the same thing as attention deficit disorder Right. But they're still going to get treated with it because, like I said, young kids really don't find school entertaining at all. It may not necessarily be over-diagnosed as much as when they do diagnose and they over give them too much of a dosage, not necessarily overdose, but but give them too high of a dose where it mm -hmm. down too much because I've seen that where it turns kids into like robots. Yeah. So they're so medicated. I don't know 
how we're going to accurately diagnose. I think, uh, I think that it's, have you ever, does anybody have ADHD? I mean, been diagnosed with it? No. No? No. So I was diagnosed with it, I don't know, 20 years ago. And uh, I went without medication for a while. So when I go to my doctor to get a refill on my prescription, um, <laughs> the questionnaire that they ask you is anybody could go in and just circle an answer. So they could just, that's how they, that's how they do it here at least. But for children, like Eddie said, I, they are hyperactive and, uh, but I think other factors to help it, to help that be accurately diagnosed would be looking into the child's home life and their school attendance and their grades and especially observations made by their teachers because their teachers are the ones that are around them the most. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it should just be based on what the parents think. Yeah. Because a part of me thinks, okay, I have a, I have a, a child who's bouncing off the walls, but I, I, I could never go into the doctor and say, yeah, my, my, ch my children are bouncing off the walls from the time they wake up until the time they go to bed because it, they're kids. They just want to run around and play. So I think it's a whole factor of things that need to be brought into a diagnosis. Because they could be acting out because something's happening at home. True. Sure. Everything to say, Emma? It looked like you kind of had a thought. I don't know. What I was reading about was uh, how children whose birthday is in like August, so they turn four right before they start school, are a lot younger compared to their classmates. And since they're kind of behind in development, they're 30 to 60% more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. So I think that uh, we should take more into consideration that they're younger and compare them to their peers and not just say mm -hmm. that's what it is. Yeah, that's what I think. Uh, the f okay, so the fifth one is delaying school times. Is it a good idea? Yeah. I, I, was this one like later to start or was it delaying the start time for children? Like the time they would begin in the morning or the age they would begin entering yeah, school? Time. It was like the time instead of eight. Later in the morning. I, I don't know. I, I start... Cause I do the, I do virtual right now because of COVID with mm -hmm. the girl, with my girls, we start at eight 30 and it's insane. The amount of work that they have when you pull up their daily plan Um, my oldest daughter, she has sometimes like 10 classes come up, but there's only the core classes that they need to do. The other ones are just extra if they want to. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that, I don't know, I wouldn't start later because we finish earlier. 
Yeah. And by the time we get to one o'clock, I mean, you can tell they're exhausted with, with learning everything. My biggest thing would be most people's jobs would interfere with being able to drop their kids off at school, probably. That's true. Yeah. I guess, I mean, most, I guess most people's probably nine to five, I guess, but I'm sure there's a lot of people that work before eight. So. Um, anyone else? All right, the sixth one is evening dinners as a protective factor against drug abuse. Huh? What? <laughs> Do evening dinners, what? are evening dinners a protective factor against drug abuse? Fuck no. <laughs> Fuck no. Um, yeah, if they're home, if they're home eating dinner, it's going to keep them from at that time you act like you you act like you act like kids are gonna find it no matter if mm -hmm. they eat dinner at home if they really want that shit they're gonna get it no matter what i i agree what are you doing i agree with that i mean I, statistically from what i've read yes it it's been shown to stop all right go go wash your hands all right, go ahead, wash them. Bring, over, bring the chair over. It's okay, just give me a minute. Um, it, but realistically, I think that there are a mul there's, a, um, there's multiple factors that encourage drug use. I mean, people you hang out with or right now, right, the it's insane how high the overdose rate is in certain states. Like I think the number one state is West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I know that number four is Ohio where I am right now. And that's, uh, once you try it, uh, that's it, you don't stop. So it I don't. On the drug. It does. I mean, well, I think that opiates, heroin, like heroin or meth, the hard those, ones. yeah, those are once you start, there's, it's virtually impossible to stop. Yeah. And heavy abuse, it's extremely hard to get any kind of help because you have to be willing and after after a whole after uh ex after over after abusing meth it stops producing dopamine so you can't feel good unless you get your next fix. Stop it. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Sitting at a table and eating dinner with your family doesn't necessarily involve talking. Yeah. I mean, you could sit I gonna there. Say, I was going to say more the, the one on one personal conversations that you would have and get right. like what your kids are doing and also being able to teach maybe values or whatever. The kids also lie. Yeah. What? Yeah. The kids lie. I think it's just being there though. I mean, probably the majority yeah. is being there and listening to them and what they're doing. But at the same time, I also don't know too many people that do actual hard things. Marijuana, yeah, of course, but. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I can name like five people that do opiates or heroin. So when you say drug, like overuse of drugs, I'm just thinking weed. So, well, I mean, technically that's legal for medicinal purposes in yeah, most but, states. Yeah. 
That's what I just think of. And at that time, like, because I know some people that can't eat unless they hot. So I feel like that dinner shit's not even about to help them at all. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't think that, because I mean, my previous job, there were a lot of, a lot of wealthy children, a lot of wealthy kids who yeah. ended up becoming hardcore drug users. And uh, they had, you know, present parents. They had family time with their parents. Mm -hmm. I, I just think it depends on the person and who they're with. Yeah. But even, even if your family is there for you and you can talk to them, the issue with drug abuse is the parents will always bail them out. So that was that was one of my questions. Every time I every time I came into contact with somebody, um, who was it was it was mainly heroin and meth, but they all said the same thing. That's okay, you know, my parents will bail me out. So, uh, in my experience, in my former career, I, I don't I don't see how family dinners can actually prevent drug abuse. It's more of an enabling thing. But parents are not ready to give up on their kids yeah. ever at any age. Anyone else? I mean, Amber, you said last time you came from a religious family. You froze on my screen. I can't see her. Okay. Um, anything else? Interesting. During this week. What? Oh, I was just saying during this week is what it was, right? Um interesting this week. Yeah, what was it? Was what seven and chapter seven and eight? Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't really. There she is. I, don't, I, I mean, it was all pretty much. Yeah, I didn't really, there wasn't really anything else. Find anything interesting, Amber? Hey, no, 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 no. How I think definitely if you've already got started. Again. Oh, I was looking at that. He posted the website for a link to the even a little marijuana may change teens' brain. Kind of interesting. Showing what one or two uses. 
did. Well, I think that's the what same with um, alcohol. Mm -hmm. could change your genes. Alcohol can change your genes? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's very shocking. You can make your, make your offspring easier to be addicted. Oh. My offspring are going to be in for a hell of a time, man. <laughs> Is that what it said? <laughs> I guess. Is that the gist of it? I don't know, I just I also think it's how you grow up too. I yeah. mean, yeah, they if you're have around it. What? If you're like around it, like your parents try to Well no, I actually feel the opposite. I feel the opposite. I think that if it, from what I've seen in my experience, um is children who are around it so if they see alcoholics drug addicts whatever um they don't want to be like that mm -hmm. so but the problem is is that with state funding and state resources I, like cps you know what cps is Mm -hmm. They might call it yeah. what? Okay. They don't do anything. And it's amazing. So if you can't get a child out of an environment, then yes, their chances of becoming an addict are much higher. Mm -hmm. But it, I remember... So I used to be, I used to be a cop and, um, I remember one call where we went into this house and it was, it was a, it was a mess. I mean, it was disgusting. There were bugs everywhere. Uh, had it, it looked like it hadn't been cleaned in months and there's just a child there in a dirty diaper that looked like ha it hadn't been changed in weeks. And the, the parent is OD'd on the floor. Mm. And I think it took, by the time squad got there, it took about 15 shots of Narcan to bring him back. CPS did nothing. It was, the grandma came over and just, they did nothing. And the child went back with the parents. So, the age, I mean, in diapers, he couldn't have been more than two. I highly doubt he'll remember that. But as, mm. he grows, as he gets older and sees more of that and is not removed from the home, I think that that plays a big part on addiction mm. and drug abuse and repeating the patterns. Yeah. You said you were, you were a police officer? Yeah. Yeah. How long? I uh, I was it's about five years. Karma started getting nervous. What? Yeah. No, it's interesting. What? I said Kramer started yeah. getting nervous. What? <laughs> I mean, I nothing to get nervous state. about. I don't care what happens in other states. <laughs> it's okay. But uh yeah, it was, it, it's a lot different here. I mean, we have a huge, we have a huge meth problem. We have a huge heroin problem. Um, and, and it's fentanyl. sad. What? And fentanyl waste. Perhaps. Yes. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of women who are pregnant and they give birth to their children and, they are in. Have you ever seen a baby go through withdrawal? Yeah, my sister's a labor and delivery nurse. What? 
My sister's a labor and delivery nurse, so I've gotten to see what they have to take care of them, and they are just constant crying and screaming and shaking and seizures, and it's horrible. But yet again, those children are not taken away from their parents. Yeah, yeah, because they have to, yes, but it doesn't usually get resolved. Yeah, and it's, it's, because nothing is nothing's wrong with the child. The child, you know, it, it if the if the baby doesn't pass away because of those symptoms, yeah, they, they don't get. Them. They just walk. They just walk out with the baby. It's just it's it's sad and it's pathetic, but they don't have enough people for the who work for the state.